One of the first things I'd like to do is uh, thank all our sponsors that helped us put together and provide input and money uh, for today's event. And I'm going to just read through the list. Um, South Dakota Wheat Commission, Farm Credit Services of America, Wheat Growers, Mustang Seed, Monsanto, Prairie State Seeds, Next Level Ag LLC, Millborn Seeds, Lacrosse Seeds, Dakota Best Seed, Agronomy Plus, Farmers Alliance, Mitchell, First Dakota National Bank, c and Operations in Davidson County Implement, Scott Supply, Crop Tech, Ducks Unlimited, Aurora County Conservation District, Davidson County Conservation District, Hanson County Conservation District, uh, South Dakota No-Till Association, SDSU Extension, USDA and NRCS, and Pioneer Hybrids of DuPont. So let's give them all a welcome round of applause. Thanks, Dan. <clears throat> You know, I want to thank you all for being here, and, and I'm going to make a point here in a little bit that uh, some of you are going to go home, and you're going to think I'm nuts, and you're always going to remember me as that crazy guy that talked about putting cows on corn. Should we write that down? You should write that down. And Ken Olson sat here this morning and said, you know, the, the two pounds of corn or the no corn with protein supplement versus the, the 10 pounds of corn, maybe you're getting maybe over into dairy territory, and that might be appropriate because I grew up on a dairy farm. so. Maybe that's where it comes from. That's where I'm from, Corsica, South Dakota. Um, we refer to this general region of South Dakota as the tropics. You get about 100 miles north of there, you start getting into the tundra. So, you know, two days ago it was 75 degrees there. Today we're supposed to get about a foot of snow. So it can vary quite a bit. Uh, background to, to my operation, uh, you know, I, I run my, I, I'm originally from the area. My dad has an operation there. I help my dad with his operation and, and I have my own operation. We kind of trade back and forth with labor and machinery. I give him a little more labor, he gives me a little more machinery. Um, I manage grazing on lease, uh, I guess I can in May and June. Um, I switched to doing that a couple years ago. I really like that. Uh, as someone who has an additional job off farm, it's really nice not to be able, needing to check the cattle repeatedly and in May and June. That's when the deer are having their fawns, the buffalo are calving out in Custer, and it works out really nice for us. Uh, we manage the grazing on leased land in the summer, one seven day moves. This is one of our summer leased pastures. There you can see our poly wire, um, and we have just above ground pipe that we run to get them water for that. And yes, those are cows, that's about five foot tall uh, grass. We utilize a lot of crop residue in the fall and winter. Uh, I've run a lot of corn stalks. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, we wean. We don't have a set weaning date. You know, it, it's kind of a shifting target depending on what's, uh, what the conditions are that year. And, and we really strive to be efficient with our purchase inputs and machinery use. As a, as a beginning farmer, you know, we're really looking at economics over and over again. So the first point I want to make is, you know, what are your goals? Um, that's, that's going to, de to determine a lot of what you want to do. You know, you've heard today about swath grazing, bale grazing, cover crops, and all of those are really good options, but they all have a really uh, specific uh, outcome. You know, you're looking for a specific thing. Cover crops can add a lot of diversity, ground cover into your operation. Uh, bale grazing is a great way to bring in nutrients and spread them out on the land. Swath grazing can, can spread those nutrients while also uh, keeping down some of your cost on the, on the harvesting. Those are all really good options. And I'm not trying to take away from any of those when I start talking about grazing corn. I'm just saying this is another option for people with a specific goal, I guess. Doug talked a little bit about uh, cattle eating uh, can of the thistle. This is a can of the thistle plant. Uh, you can see a couple of them in there. Yes, you can see that they pretty much came in there and chose can of the thistle. Uh, this was taken last year, my cow's elite Canada thistle. Um, I have very little issue with it anymore. So, you know, you can see some back there that still have flowers on them. If they really get to a point where it looks like, okay, I've got too many, I'll go out there and I'll cut them usually. I don't 
usually have to spray. The grazing management has kind of done away with that for me. Goal setting, uh, this is kind of the goal setting. If you look at goal setting, the holistic management, those of you familiar with Alan Savory talks about the, the triple bottom line, social, financial, and environmental. So we base uh, some of our goals and our plans based off these. And you know, I use this, uh, this quote out of Proverbs. I could have picked any of them, but you know, without vision, without goals, you, know, you aren't going to succeed. So some of our goals, just to give you a background again, why, how we got to grazing corn, uh, graze as many of the days of the year as possible to keep the cost down. Uh, our goal is to feed hay less than 45 days a year. I could probably get that under 30 and have. Uh, it's just kind of the slush times when you're transitioning from one to the other or it gets muddy. We deal more with mud, it seems like, than anything, especially when you're dealing with cropland. Appropriate rest in our grazing rotation for plant vigor, livestock health, wildlife and soil health. I actually have a wildlife degree. That's what I went to school for. Um, so I'm really interested in wildlife and that's also why I'm interested in livestock. Um, and so we try to allow appropriate rest and then we try to have an enterprise our children can be involved in. One thing we did about three years ago, we quit uh, fly control in the summer because it was hurting our dung beetles. And, and you could see we had four or five year old dung pats left out in our, in our uh, pastures yet. And so we did away with that and I can tell you we have, you, you really can't find manure pats in, in my pasture anymore. And so it's really helped. So what we did instead is I started building tree swallow boxes and uh, an adult uh, pair of tree, swallow, tree swallows, they tell me you'll eat about 3,000 flies a day. So it's helped. I'm not gonna tell you I don't have any flies, but I really don't think I have any more flies than my neighbors. And one thing about when you're this far north, your tree swallows like to leave about the middle of July. And that's, you know, so they, they do pretty well at first, but by the uh, middle of August, it's a little bit uh, more touch and go. This is my oldest, Lily. She's very unhappy because she doesn't get to look in the bird box and see the baby birds. That's my middle one, Brianna. I have three children, three girls. So before I get into the corn grazing, here's my warning for you. I'm not a nutritionist. So take that with a grain of salt. I do not know your cows or your version of risks. If your cows have never touched corn, you might think twice before putting them on a corn grazing situation. And I may not have the same goals as you. We already talked about goal setting. And I have done some crazy things that haven't turned out well. We're not gonna get into that today, but I have. So a little bit of history, just for my winter feeding. I bought cows in 2011, that makes me a beginning farmer, I guess. Uh, drought in 2012, of course, uh, we, I think we had a little bit worse than you hit in northern South Dakota, in southern South Dakota. Feed was very expensive and a lot of our corn was harvested for silage. I use a lot of corn stalks, but that year they just weren't available. Um, so it, it was very expensive to feed cattle that year. In 2014, of course, we had a good cattle market. We had some more summer drought that year. Had some good fall rains with muddy fields and the rainy fall. Two years ago, our uh, corn stalks were almost worthless. They, the, the cattle did very, very poorly on them. And then we had, on top of that, a cattle market drop. And so you start to see the economics change. And this year we've had snow, ice, mud. You know, you guys have probably had a worse year than we have, but I've dealt with a lot of mud. And when you're dealing with a cropland situation, that's not great. So what this boils down to is that year to year, we really have inconsistent winter grazing opportunities, especially when it relates to grazing crop stubble down there. And so I was looking for something that was a little more consistent, a little more forgiving, I guess. And why I thought I could graze corn, you know, the biggest thing here is other producer experience. I know of other producers that have done it. I'm looking them up all the time, trying to figure out how I can do this thing. Um, originally, they told me, man, you gotta be moving those cows every day. And I, I bought that. I said, okay, I gotta move cows every day. And I did. And it was, uh, it, it's kind of hard to get excited about moving cows every day uh, unless you can push a button and make it happen, which Dwayne's going to talk about. But, uh, you know, you start to learn a few things. You know, this first year I had cows, man, you could go out in the field that I turned them into and you could fill one of those uh, molasses tubs just in an area, you know, like this. There was so much corn on the ground. And the thing I learned there is when cows eat a lot of corn, they will eat a lot of salt. 
they went through a 50 pound black salt every day. And that was for 40 cows. You know, they just pounded through the salt. 2014, I grazed a trap cornfield. There was basically no stover left, but it had bad eardrop again. That was a really dry year. For some reason, the ears dropped off. They could go to bean stubble. That's where I was watering them, so they could fill up a little bit. Uh, my cows came off that field the fattest I've ever seen them. That was about 40 days uh, on about 50 acres. There was that much corn left out there. And it was just corn, you know, just corn cobs. So I've not, at any time I turn cows into corn stalks, they're going for the years, you know, that's just, they like it. But I've not lost a cow, cow to acidosis. I know they have varying levels of tolerance. They've, you know, they've gotten used to corn and I don't, I try to make sure that they don't have just corn or that they have another option. So why did I decide to graze corn? Availability, we talked about inconsistency. Availability is a big thing. It's gonna be there. I live more in Southeast South Dakota and we're trying to look like Iowa, I guess. So we have a lot of corn down there available. So on the landscape, it's there. And in all kinds of weather, you grow corn, that ear's usually, what, three to four feet off the ground. You can get a lot of snow before that corn, the main nutritional part of that plant is unavailable. And that's a pretty big deal when you start talking about uh, winter grazing opportunities. You know, I, I have nothing against it. I, I like cover crops. I like uh, the swath grazing, but you get two, three feet of snow and it gets pretty tough to, to make use of that. But the corn, it's still there. Uh, nutrition, like I said, we switched to May, June calving. I want to try and keep my cows on the calves through the, the calves on the cows through the winter. And that's what I did this year. And I thought it went pretty well. We'll see a picture of that later. Um, Flexibility. If you plant a cover crop, you're going to graze it or roll it. I mean, there's, you, you don't have a plan B for making an economic, uh, getting a check from it. If you leave 10 acres of corn and you can't graze them, say you, you have another option, some cover crop, you can always go harvest it in the spring and you'll still get, you know, you'll, you'll lose some to wildlife and stuff, but you'll still get it back. Return, return nutrients to the same acres. That's going to depend how you manage it. I didn't do a great job of managing returning nutrients in the same acres. You can see back here, this is a pasture they could get into for water. We'll see a better picture of that later. But uh, they, you know, they loafed in the pasture. Most of their nutrients ended up there. This is a back wire. You can see it was getting muddy here. There's my tracks. Those aren't as deep as they look. But uh, I did back fence this, and this was a big thing. I dealt with more ice than anything. Uh, this was a warm spell we had. Wildlife, another thing, you know, just if you have food plots and you're leaving them through the end of pheasant season. Um, I know there's some pheasant hunters in here, some guys that get pheasant hunters in. You leave your food plots, maybe you just go out and graze them after that. And, and it's a win for the wildlife. We were, we were shooting pheasants out of here and we had deer in here um, up until I basically, well, up until it was gone with the pheasants. If an ear of corn hit the ground, it was clean the next day. It didn't stick around. So there was a lot of pheasants using it. There it goes. Oh. Okay, this is a big reason why I graze corn, the cost or the value. Um, Doug mentioned this morning, 10 pounds of corn will carry a cow. That's kind of what I've heard too. Uh, if she doesn't have a calf on her, that's the general recommendation there. So my goal with a calf on her is to give 12 to 14 pounds. And so I'm looking at about a quarter of a bushel. I just looked up what it was at the local elevator. They're giving 320 a bushel. That's 80 cents a cow per day. Comparison, hay feeding costs. Uh, most of the winter at the Dakota Hay Auction in Corsica, 80 bucks a ton will buy you decent quality hay. You can see in the calculations there, it's uh, almost double to feed hay. And that, you know, that doesn't involve this. You're gonna have some labor to get out there and move fence, you are. This, you're going to have labor to get out there, start a tractor, feed the hay, haul the, new, the manure in the spring. Corn stalk rent. I like corn stalks. I use them when I can. Uh, I've heard all kinds of range for what people are paying for them. Doug said 70 cents. I've heard as low as 30. But your quality and your availability start to get questionable uh, depending on your weather conditions. So I, in Potter County, I asked Kay to send me some data for Potter County. So these are your three-year averages for 2013 to 2015. Uh, about six to seven acres to run a cow-calf for the summer grazing period. Of course, it's going to be more in the west and less in the east. 
Uh, about two tons per acre hay yield, that's your average of alfalfa and grass. Uh, and about 123 bushel per acre corn yields. So, a quick just scenario, 300 cows would require about 2,000 acres of grass for summer grazing, but could winter for 150 days on just over 80 acres of corn, giving them 12 pounds of corn per head per day. That's where, you know, I'm not telling you you should go out and plant a bunch of corn to graze it. You know, you don't need a lot of corn. You don't going to be covering a lot of ground when you're corn grazing. And that's kind of a valuable thing when, especially when you're young, to be able, not need as many acres to, to produce the feed for the winter. Enough hay to feed for the same period would be cut from about 400 acres. So potentially, you know, if you were doing this anyway, say you had a mixed crop livestock operation, now you can graze those 400 acres. Maybe add a few cattle, maybe help bring a, a, another family member back into the operation. Time and machinery investment, of course, you're going to put in time and machinery to hay. You're also going to put in time and machinery to plant. Uh, I didn't do an uh, analysis of that. You can do your own numbers depending on what interests you have. So you have options. Uh, you can do daily moves where you set up your perimeter before the ground freezes and then do your daily allocations. I use, a, I use a cordless drill to put it into ice, frozen ground, whatever, and then your post comes right out the next day. Um, it works really well for me. Uh, you can do multiple day or weekly moves. I got a little bit into that this year. The Canadians do it. Be aware of your risks. Your cows are gonna waste a little more, and depending on what you're, how much you're giving them in terms of corn grain, you're probably gonna have to give them a little bit more. When you're giving them 10 pounds of corn, and like Doug said, you got 10 pounds of corn, 10 pounds of stover, 20 pounds is not gonna fill a cow. They're gonna be hungry, but their nutritional needs are met. So you're gonna have to up that if you're gonna start moving less than daily, or more off less than daily, because they're going to eat as much as they can to get full, and by day four or five of a week, they aren't gonna have a whole lot left. That's where you, know, you may have to give them a few more pounds of corn. Multiple week moves, uh, again, this is something the Canadians do. Uh, and I, I actually just talked to a, a gentleman out by uh, Rapid City here a couple days ago. He does this and, and does really well. You know, he said he's got 5,000 acres of grass and 200 acres of corn that he winters on. And that's, that carries his cows. And that's pretty amazing when you think about it, that you could take your best piece of ground, basically, and grow your winter feed on it and it, it would be a, such a small part of it. Uh, you can give cattle an addition area for roughage. Again, this is just for gut fill. It doesn't have to be high quality. You're, you're getting your nutritional quality out of the corn grain. Um, feed hay if you want to. You could, I did feed alfalfa because I left the calves on. I needed that, alf that protein level to be high enough. Um, and then you could use snow. Doug said he does it. I don't uh, trust it yet, so I haven't gotten that far, but maybe in the future. General considerations, planning, you know, and, and, and if there's one significant point, I, I think we could all take away from this, is what uh, Casey said this morning. You gotta plan. Dan, if you decided you wanna winter graze a full season cover crop next winter, when do you gotta decide that? Right now. Right now. Yeah, absolutely. So planning, even if you want to graze corn, you got to plan ahead and you probably need to be planning at least midsummer, so that you can be prepared for where you're going to have fence, water, shelter, snow drift. Whoop. Think about if you're right next to a bean field and you get a foot of snow and the wind blows, now you're going to have drifts five foot deep in there. Um, planning. You can gradually increase your grain for rumen. Again, just protecting from acidosis. Uh, a lot of people recommend that. I'm probably not as good as I should be at that. And then just looking what your other options are for winter grazing, you know, what's, what's your goal here? Uh, this is Dwight D. Eisenhower. You had a quote from him a little bit ago. Uh, I really like this one. Plans are useless, but planning is indispensable. Things change, so be ready to adapt. Uh, I thought this was kind of a neat idea. You know, our plan is to get from point A to point B, find out there's a few pitfalls along the way. Uh, sometimes we think we're going to start here and we're going to end on this date and they're going to get this much corn every day and 
then you get a snowstorm and maybe you're gone for a day and the point is you got closer to your goal than where you were at the beginning and that's kind of where I stand I guess on that. Example plan, I don't know if we need to go into this but uh, if you're looking at, if you got 10 acres, 100 bushels an acre uh, and you're going to give 12 pounds per cow per day your grazing area is about 100 foot by 100 foot so plan to have your fences set up so you can move that. Set up your fences so daily moves have short stretches of fence. You don't want to, I, I don't want to move a quarter mile of fence when the ground is frozen. I think Larry does, but uh, that's something I try to stay away from if I can. So what I did this year, uh, December 30th, I moved cattle into the corn. This is st standing corn. Uh, it was about 100 bushel an acre corn. 55 days of feed projected at that time on what I had. I started them at about six to seven pounds. I didn't want to drop them right into the corn. They were coming off corn stalks. There wasn't a lot of grain left in the corn stalks. And then I gave them grass hay for fill. I had trouble with fence. So some were getting all they wanted. They had about two to three inches of ice. And, and I watched cows, I'd move cows, and I'd have cows go up there and they'd start reaching across that fence because I had corn right there. And, and they'd, you know, they'd blink a little bit and they'd just keep going. And, and so I, I ended up with three, fen three wires, a hot on the top and bottom and a uh, ground in the middle. Of course, I had calves. I think without calves, I could have got away with two. Uh, and my cows respect electric fence. You know, I've got, I don't have the really high dollar electric fence, or fencer yet, but uh, my cows respect it and, and I use it year round. But I learned that if, when I put up a fence, I knock down basically a four-wheeler width on the other side of it so that they weren't reaching for it and that helped out a lot. So I quickly moved them up to 12 pounds per pair per day because uh, that was my goal. So once they started getting the corn, you know, once that rumen gets switching, uh, I wanted to get them onto that and then I was giving alfalfa twice a week for protein and gut fill. I would think about distillers, but the thing about distillers is not going to give them anything to be satisfied with. I talked with my nutritionist he said, yep, alfalfa is your best way to go, dollar for dollar, it made the most sense. And then I went to every other day moves. My initial plan was to get to every fourth day moves. I never got there because the, uh, the weather didn't cooperate with me. The weather was changing, next thing you know it's going to snow. I don't want them to be knocking ears on the ground, it gets covered with a bunch of snow. Then it'd get muddy and I didn't want them tromping it in. So I went to every other day moves and then I was just pitching them a little bit of alfalfa on day two in the evening. Again, the cattle had the adjacent pasture. This is what my fence looked like and this is the part I was grazing. I just ran my fences across this way. I had to speed up because of the mud. Of course, like I said, it was 75 degrees. We don't have frost in the ground right now. Well, not a lot. Um, and I didn't want them tracking that up. So I, I sped them up and they were getting over probably closer to 25 pounds per pair per day and they did just fine. You know, none of them keeled over dead, but they were used to corn. And they were, you know, their rumen was functioning on corn. So I ended up with 47 days of feed. That's where, you know, I, I originally projected I have another week of feed, but I, uh, I came up a little short and I, I didn't feel bad about that, I guess. Um, one thing I didn't plan for and, and should in the future, I didn't have a plan to take them off of corn back to forage. And, and that switching that rumen back was pretty hard on them, especially going up this high. And um, that's something that I, I'll have to plan for in the future because that was definitely not, uh, not in my plan at the time. A couple pictures of what it looked like. There's the cows shortly after I moved them in. There's my fence uh, that I put in. You can see that corn, that's some of the better corn um, that they graze. This, the, to turn from you know standing corn to this, took about five hours. You know, that was, I went back and I kicked them out because you can see it's starting to thaw. I figured it was going to get muddy that day. Um, you can see all the ice again. And so they knock it down pretty fast. Uh, there's actually more uh, residue there than maybe it looks like just because a lot of it is under the ice. Lessons learned for me, I guess, just like I said, it was the first year I tried it. Ground wires and a good energizer. When you have ice and snow, Cows, uh, they'll, they'll test it, even cows that are used to uh, electric fence. Keeping the salt buffer and mineral available, that way a cow can balance herself. 
This was uh, this is a salt. I feed a sea salt, and this is uh, baking soda. It's a rumen buffer, and that's what my nutritionist has me on. Um, and I could tell you, from one day to the next, they basically emptied this, and that was where I went. Okay, they they got enough, and I think this was about three days after I went to every other day moves where that first day they could eat all the corn they wanted. And so I made sure I kept it in there. I put another 50 pounds of salt in there and it lasted the rest of the great, you know, the rest of the 40 days. They hardly touched it again. But they were able when they needed it to, to get that salt. I suppose it helped to, to make their rumen function and, and keep, them, keep them from getting too, too acid in their rumen. Keep your options open, adapt. You know, we had some issues. You're gonna have issues. Uh, yield is not consistent across the field, just like it's not consistent across the, the county. Plan for it. I didn't do a great job of that either. I thought, hey, we're gonna have, you know, it's 100 bushel an acre. Well, it might be 80 bushel over here and 120 there. And that was just something I, you know, I didn't plan for it very well. Cows will be hungry. They were always ready to move. Uh, I, on two occasions, I had to be gone, so I, I asked my dad to just give him a bale of hay while I was gone to help, you know, carry him through. The next day, they, they'd be full. They'd go in there, they'd grab those ears of corn, and they'd roll them in their mouth. Those of you who have seen cows do this, and the corn starts falling out the side of the mouth. Um, and that's what they do if they're full. They're just going for that extra energy. If they came in there and, and their rumen was ready, it had room in it, they just eat the ear, eat the whole ear, and, and it worked out a lot better that way. Uh, the soil structure residue mat, that's going to help you a lot with mud. This is a cow. I don't know how well you can see her. This is her calf that she carried. Uh, she's probably 12 to 1250. She's not a huge cow. She has no teeth. So just keep that in mind for how well she did. Um, so, and I carried, yeah, there's a yearling back there. She's bred heifer. Um, I carried those and they came through really well on this too, just in the same program. Um, and this was, this was the last day. So this was the last day of grazing. You can see we've got water and no snow. And that was a week and a half ago or something. So they came through pretty well. So again, back to how we started, have a goal. Know what your goal is. Make a plan, you know. It took me from the time I heard about corn grazing to actually do it, it was about four years. I had to have a plan. And I never got a plan put in place early enough. And then adapt because things are gonna change. You're gonna get three feet of snow or something like that. That's me. Uh, if you have any questions, you can call me, email me. Um, this is another thing. I'm looking for earthworms. These are chickens. We raise chickens. It's a, Odd deal. We can talk about that another time. Josh, what if you were just going to get started? I mean, like Doug said, we've got a 12 row head. So what would happen if you did 12 and left 12, and then figure out how many acres the cows need? Mm -hmm. I mean, would would something like that work to get started, and then like do an 80 and leave graze 40 and not? Or what? Mm -hmm. What's your thoughts on that? You know, the nice thing if you were going to do that is now you've got additional roughage for them to pick up because you've got part of it. You know, the, the piece I was, my dad was grazing the corn stalks. I was grazing the standing corn. And so he was, you know, otherwise I would have been probably using, utilizing that forage, you know, just to help fill them up. Um, and, and maybe that wouldn't have worked as well, simply because, like Ken was saying this morning, maybe they would have gotten their room in so full of poor quality forage, they wouldn't have been actually balancing the ration well. Um, but absolutely, you can do that. My stretch, it was 50 rows wide, is what it was. Uh, I, would go, I would go less. 12 would be great because I wouldn't have to have a post in the middle. I could run from one fence to the other fence without any post in the middle. Um, and, and that would be nice. Dwayne's laughing. I think he disagrees with me. <laughs> no, I think it's fine. <laughs> but yeah, you could do that. And like I said, if you're going to be you know, adjusting you know, to the day, you, know, you can checker it out like what Doug did, and that's great. But then you're locked in whether you've got 100 cows or 150 cows, or if something changes, um, you're kind of locked into that size. If you're gonna do the adjusting sizes like I did, just make sure you're knocking it down 
in front of them so that they're not reaching so much. That made a big difference for them staying in. How'd you get them to <coughs> the corn then? I know, I know you feed them corn, but how, how do you do that? How did you do that? I started them right, right in the standing corn and then I was just giving them hay to, to fill them because they came off corn stalks. They were grazing corn stalks before that. And I just started them on the standing corn. You know, I know guys that go out and feed them with a feed wagon. Again, you know, I don't have a lot of the fancy stuff. So not that I couldn't have done it that way, but I just, I was giving them hay and starting them on corn and I, I just moved them up quickly. Cause like I said, in the past, I've grazed them on some really high corn stuff. And I'm not even convinced that I needed to start them lower. I may have just been able to start them right away and made sure that they had those, you know, the, the forage to keep their, their rumen full and then the, the salt, the buffer to help balance the rumen. I talked to my nutritionist about this. You know, how can you get away with multiple day moves? How can you get away with them consuming this much? Uh, his take was the whole corn doesn't have the same effect in the rumen as what ground corn does. Uh, and especially dry whole corn, it just, it doesn't release its starch as quickly. That was his take on it. Um, but I did work with him. How did you uh, move your wire in the field when you graze in a whole field? Because you gotta walk down the standing corn, right? Mm-hmm. So you're asking, how did I get the wire down here? Yeah. I just walked through, and you'd be surprised how easy a corn stalk breaks off when it's frozen. <coughs> and it fall over, you know, and I'd clean it out my, that way. Like I said, that's 50 rows. Uh, that's two posts it takes me to spread it out. It, it didn't take me long to, to move the fence. I mean, I could, I could pick up the old fence. The worst was the cows were, you know, always ready to move, but I could pick up the old fence, put in a new fence in half an hour at most. Put in the new fence first, I always had a backup fence. I always had a safety fence from right away. That's a good point. That way, if they got through, they weren't all the way through it, knocking it down. They were just grazing the next piece. And other than the first week when I had issue, once I got the, the ground wire and got them used to it and learned to knock it over, they didn't go through it anymore. I didn't have any more issue. Did you plant normal corn or did you plant Th th corn? This, nope, this was whatever he had. This, it was just gonna work out in this field. I didn't, this corn wasn't planted for grazing, I guess is the point. It was planted to harvest, but we said, hey, it looks like an option for us, so we chose to graze it. <coughs> Because you're really better off getting the most production you can off off your corn acres. I mean, you shouldn't pull back a lot on your production costs because whatever you grow is just going to extend your grazing. Mm -hmm. One note on that, and, and I don't disagree with you. You know, this was hundred bushel corn, and if you look, pretty much everything above the ear they eat. You know, they'll eat the stalk. You start getting that really high bushel corn; those stalks get really tough for the cows and, and the, the cobs will get really big. Um, and so that's a consideration. I'm not gonna say that it's, it's a hindrance, but um, you know, if I had my way, I'd, I'd definitely keep it in that 100 to 120 bushel for grazing purposes. So you get that corn. From my dad, yes. So it was still Absolutely, yeah. Well, like I said, it was, it was about, with the alfalfa, it was less than a dollar a day. And I had calves on that, so I split that cost between the cow and the calf. That's where I get away from how, you know, how much does it cost me to raise a cow. How much buffer do they eat? Almost none. Is that right? I was surprised. My, my cows are backwards on salt and buffer. They get poor quality feed and they eat buffer, and then they get high quality feed, they eat salt, which is apparently backwards from what it's supposed to be. I don't know. They, the, what you see there was basically, well, what you see there, now that's, you know, that ended up being gone by the time it was done, but they started that and maybe that was covered, you know, during the entire period they maybe ate 50 pounds. It just, it wasn't much, except for the one day they, they really went after it and so it was good I had it. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about your above ground watering system? Particularly, you don't have snow, you don't trust the guys looking snow? Right. In this situation, the above ground watering system is, is for summer grazing, right? So I'm running from a pasture tap so I can divide my pasture. In the winter time, I had a, a frost free water, you know, just a general water livestock fountain and they were able to get back to it. So 
Uh, let's see, picture here, you know, this, this was the loafing pasture. You can see uh, the dairy barn for the place is actually about right here and there's a frost free water right here behind these trees. So they were able to get, you know, behind the trees and, and get their water there. I can talk to you about the above ground water line later if you want to, but for this situation it didn't really apply. The, the weather though, like on bad storms, like bitter cold, I mean they still go, they still go to the corn then? Oh, they, <clears throat> if I drive out there with the pickup right now, I've got cows following me everywhere I go. I was out there yesterday, I let them clean up a little bit. I weaned the calves after I was done with corn, um, and so I went out there yesterday to pick up fence and, and they just followed me. And I actually let them in there to just clean up some of the leaves and stuff since they had been on so much corn at the end. And they kind of looked around like, you know, where's the corn, you know, where's the standing stuff? But they have no issue, you know, through, through the snow. I, I had some other pictures that I was gonna show you of nutritional, you know, Ken talked about watching the, the, the cow pies. Uh, and, and I watched those, you know, I absolutely kept an eye on them to make sure they were getting the protein they needed. I had some pictures of that and some pictures of, we had a, about a foot of snow there in the middle of that. Um, it was between these two pictures we got another foot of snow, uh, but those got lost on my old cell phone, so I didn't have them anymore. Is there any particular direction you started on? I mean, did you start on the south side of the corn and work north? Or? I started on the west side and worked east because it's what worked the best for me at that time. If I were going to start it, you know, if I had 80 acres and it was oriented north-south, I'd start on the south side because then with the north wind, they're getting wind protection. Um, and then the snow blowing in, it's not always blowing from where they've already grazed into the new stuff. Um, same thing east-west. I started from the west, but I had all those corn stalks back here to, to stop snow for me. Um, and it, it worked out for me that way. All right, thank you.